I'd like to talk about the audacity of faith today. You know, we have to have faith regardless of what our circumstances happen to be. We see lots of times in the Bible, it's recorded for our instruction, the things that happened uh, in the past with Israel, in the Old Testament. We see that sometimes an enemy, an overwhelming enemy, would come against the people of God. And if the people of God had faith and they sought the Lord, they entreated him. And they would humble themselves before the Lord and say, well, we're helpless before this enemy, but we know you're not. We're helpless, and we need you. We know that you haven't brought this enemy against us to destroy us. You know, and oftentimes the enemy is brought against Israel in order for the enemy to be destroyed. Amen? So we have to think about that whenever we go through certain circumstances, because Faith doesn't mean that we won't go through trials. Look at Job. Look what Job went through. Yet at the end, what does he say? Though he slay me, I will trust in the Lord. The definition of audacity is the willingness to take bold risks. The willingness to be bold and to take a risk. Only in the Lord is, Lord is really not a risk. Although when you think about it, it seems like a risk. You think about the risk maybe that Elijah took when he faced off with uh, the prophets of Baal there at Mount Carmel. And he was alone. And as far as he knew, he was the only person that worshipped the true God. Now, the Lord later told him that he had 7,000 men that had never bowed the knee to Baal. But uh, Elijah did not know that. And Elijah was very bold, and he called out, and he mocked those uh, priests of Baal, and he called for the Lord to bring fire down from heaven. Now that, that is an act of faith. He trusted the Lord, that the Lord would deliver. And Jesus said, whatever we ask in faith, God will give. One thing we need to always understand is that we may not understand why we're going through the trials we go through. We may not understand why, you know, we're persecuted or we're having some type of a situation or circumstance that's very difficult to negotiate in our life. But one thing we can be sure of, God is not ignorant of it. God is our Father, and God loves us. And if we just continue to love him and we trust him, he will make whatever the devil brings against us, whatever, you know, the devil can only operate within the perimeters that God allows him to. We find that in the book of Job. The devil would like to do a lot of things, but God doesn't allow him to. So when God allows the devil to do something in our life, and maybe we open the door for it, I mean, that happens, right? I mean, Paul said we shouldn't give the devil opportunity, but we do sometimes. I've given the devil opportunity, and he's taken that opportunity a time or two, you see. But regardless, regardless of whether, you know, we're at fault or not, if we trust God, we put our faith in him, he will bring about, and we love him, he'll bring about good out of the situation. Our enemy will be defeated. It's not a bad thing when we see a situation because that is an opportunity for the glory of the Lord. That is an opportunity for the power of God to be on display and for God to receive glory and for people to witness that God is still God and He still cares for His people. So audacity is the willingness to take bold risks it's daring, it's fearless, and it's courageous. That's what it, and faith is the audacity that rejoices in the fact that God cannot break his own word. Amen? Let me hear an amen. I said God cannot break his own word. So we can put our trust in him. Now that doesn't mean that you know, we're not going to go through trouble. That doesn't mean that we're not going to have situations like, like Joseph did when he was in prison for 10 years. He had faith. 
but he was still in prison for 10 years. I mean, there are people today that's been, uh, you know, imprisoned, uh, wrongfully imprisoned. They're not guilty of what they're in prison for, and some of them get very bitter. And we have a prison ministry at Tucker Maximum Security. We encounter some bitter people, you see, that claim that they're innocent. And they believe that they shouldn't be there, you see. And you have, you know, but you've got Joseph. I mean, you think of him. I mean, don't you think that the devil probably tempted him with thoughts like that? Where is your God? What about the wonderful blessings, you know, that your father used to tell you about? What about the God of Israel that's supposed to bless his people? And here you are. You've tried to, you protected your uh, master and his wife accused you unjustly, wrongfully, and you've been in prison without trial for 10 years. You've just been forgotten here in this prison. But you see, Joseph kept his faith. Can you keep your faith during dry times? Can you keep your faith when... Now, let me ask you this. Do you think Joseph was praying every day? Do you think that, God, that Joseph was praying to the Father every day for the Father to deliver him from that prison? Uh, you know he was. To the cup bearer, I mean, and, and to, the, to the food taster, what did he, the baker, I mean, what did he say? He said, listen, remember me. When you get out of here, you remember me. Remember me. Tell the king that I'm still in here, you see. So you know that if he's conscious, if he's trying to get word to the king, he's talking to the true king, amen. And he's saying, Father, I, I, I'm in prison. It's been 10 years, 10 years of the prime of my life has been gone. But let me tell you something. There's nothing that you will ever lay down or God will ask you for that he will not give you an increase. God gives us faith. He gives every person a measure of faith. Just like he gives us whatever he gives us, all the blessings he gives us. If he gives us a home or if he gives us a job, if he gives us money, finances, he expects an increase. God is a God of increase. We're supposed to grow, enlarge our faith. Grow in faith. And you can't grow in faith unless you act upon it. And sometimes what happens is we're afraid God will not answer. God will always answer. He may not always answer the way we want him to answer. He didn't answer Joseph the way Joseph probably expected him to answer. He did answer Elijah exactly the way Elijah expected and wanted him to answer. But we have to understand that we have to be like Job. Though he slay me, I will trust him. In the end, whether it's in this life or in the life to come, when we just yield to God and we trust God, we will find that that was the right thing to do and that God, it was not in vain and that God has blessed us. Now think about this. The Apostle Paul's preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. He has faith. I mean, he has faith to heal the sick. Think about it. I mean, Jesus told his disciples over and over, you have little faith. I mean, what's wrong with you? How come you couldn't heal this person? I know why you couldn't heal him, because you have little faith. If you only had the faith the size of a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, be removed out of its place, be cast into the sea, and it would happen. That's what he said. But what happened to the apostles after Jesus was ascended to heaven, after his crucifixion and he ascended to heaven? They raised the dead themselves. Paul brought back to life a man that had fell off a windowsill and died there, we find in the book of Acts. In chapter 20, we find that Peter's walking into the temple and there's a man there that's lame and he says, well, I don't have any silver or gold. He's begging, but I'll tell you, I'll give you what I do have. Get up and walk. You're healed. I mean, they went forth in great power. These same people that Jesus used to say, you have little faith. What's wrong with you? Why do you fear? Why do you fear the the the, the you know, they were out at sea in the boat. Jesus is sleeping like a baby. And his head on a pillow, you know, and the storm's coming. The ship's about to, be, to uh, be sunk. You know, the waves are coming, crashing against. The wind is blowing. And his disciples are terrified. They come to him and say, what are you sleeping for? Can't you see we're about to die? I mean, there's a storm and the ship's about to sink. 
And Jesus said, oh, why do you fear? And then he asked a question. That's a question, isn't it? Why do you fear? And then he said, where is your faith? <laughs> you better go find it. You misplaced it somewhere. You must have left it on the shore. You didn't bring your faith out here in the boat with you. You see, you should have had faith. He said, why do you fear? Where is your faith? Simple. And he says that to us. Why do you fear? Where is your faith? Now, that tells us something. That tells us that faith is, is the answer. Now, we know perfect love casts out fear. But when we have faith in God, we don't fear. You know why? Because we trust whatever God is doing. We don't walk by sight. We don't look and say, well, it looks like I'm in a bad situation. It looks like God is not answering my prayer. It looks like I must have done something to offend God. Listen, read the prayers of David. How often did David say, where are you, Lord? I'm crying out to you. I don't hear you. I've been there, haven't you? I've been there. But you know, I find out later God was there all along. He was there all along. And he was working. He just wasn't working in the way that I thought he was working, the way I wanted to. We have to understand one thing. God does not exist for us. We exist for him. We exist for his glory. Amen. Now think about Paul and Silas. Paul's preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's doing great miracles. He's taught by Jesus himself. And God sends him a vision of a man from Macedonia calling, come here, come to Macedonia and preach the gospel to us. That was God doing that. So Paul and Silas, they set off to uh, Philippi, which is named after, you know, Philip the Macedonian, the, the father of Alexander the Great. It's a principal, you know, an important city in, in Macedonia. So they come to Philippi and they're, they began to, they're going to be preaching the gospel. But there's this woman with a divine, with a divining spirit, a sorcery, uh, that's a slave girl. And she's following them and she's calling out, listen to these men, listen to these men. We don't know if, if she was just, we don't know what she was doing, but she was bothering Paul and Silas. And Paul turned around and said, Satan, come out of her. Well, her owners then are upset because that's how they made money. They made money out of her being able to practice her sorcery and and tell fortunes to pe people's fortunes in their future. So they had Paul and Silas arrested. Now listen, Paul and Silas went to Philippi, answering God's call in a vision. And what was it called to do? To preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the, where's the first place they preached it? In prison. They preached the gospel in prison. And while they were in prison, well, they, you know, they're, I can just picture them now, you know, chained to a wall in the innermost, the most secure part of the, the prison. They're in the innermost part, and they're beaten in their blade. They're beaten with rods. And I know that hurts. I've seen that. I've seen ISIS and the Taliban, some of the videos where they're beating people with rods. And those rods don't look very big, but people are doing everything they can to, to not to get out of the way of those rods. It must be very painful. And so they're, they're, you know, beaten and bloody for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do you hear me? I said for the gospel of Jesus Christ. For the glory of the Lord. They're there. They're beaten in prison. Unjustly incarcerated because they're Roman citizens. They weren't supposed to be treated that way without a trial. And there they are. And what is their response? Lord, you gave us a vision to come here, to preach the gospel here. What's going on? I mean, we're in prison. I don't know when we'll ever get out. That's not what they said. They began to praise. In the middle of the night, they began to praise, sing praises to God and give glory to God. They were thanking him. And, and you know that they were they were happy that they were accounted worthy to share in the sufferings of the Lord. And all the prisoners heard it. Now think about that scene. All these other prisoners and there for all kinds of reasons, they hear them praising God. Now don't you think that's not a normal response? I don't, listen, I've heard some of our prisoners sing, 
Yeah, we sing sometimes together. We'll sing today. They will. And, uh, you know, John's going. David's sick, but John's going. And Joe, you're going, aren't you? There's going to be some singing there. But I've never heard any of our prisoners down there at Tucker Maximum Security Unit sing praises because they're incarcerated. Haven't yet. Thank you, Lord, that I am in prison, that I'm incarcerated, that I am, uh, you know, locked up in a cell. I've never heard that before, but that's what was going on with Paul and Silas. They were praising God because of the circumstances they were in. They knew God was in it. God sent them. Listen to me. God sent them to preach the gospel. They did not know what was going to happen, but they encountered the devil, and the devil stirred local people up to have them beaten and incarcerated, and God did not stop it. Did you hear me? God allowed it to happen for a witness. And so they suffered. They shared in the sufferings of Christ. They're bloody. They're probably chained to a wall. I don't know. But they're in the innermost part of the prison, and they began to sing praises to God in the middle of the night, and all the other prisoners heard them. And it was so glorious, and then the power of the Lord. Now, that took faith to do that, because they believed that regardless of their circumstances, God was working, and God was going to bring about something good. He didn't send them there just to be incarcerated. He didn't send them there to be silenced. He sent them there. He didn't send them there to be run out of town. He sent them there to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and used a vision to do it. So they have faith, regardless of their circumstances, they're not crying out to God, say, whining to God, say, well, I can't do it. You know, I'm in prison and I'm not going to do it while I'm here. They weren't doing that. They trusted God already. They were waiting to see what God was going to do. And so they were thinking about that. And listen, when they begin to praise and they're joyful, you know it's because they have, that's faith. They have anticipation of what's about to happen. How God is going to turn this situation into something very, very good. Paul was the same way when he was in prison in Rome. He preached the gospel there. And so they were singing praises and the power of God came through faith and through their praise. And the power of God came and visited that little prison and the ground shook and every door opened. And there's not one record of any prisoner running out. Say, this is my opportunity to escape. They all ran in to where Paul and Silas were. They ran in to where these two beaten, and for all they knew, were they were criminals. I mean, they had to be the worst criminals. They're in the innermost part, the most secure part of the prison. And they ran in there to where they were. They didn't escape. They were drawn to what they heard and to the presence of God that fell upon that place. And when the jailer came in and he saw that all the prisoners were not in their cells and that the doors were open, he thought, well, I, you know, I'm going to be executed, so I'm just going to kill myself. And Paul saw it and he cried out and he said, don't harm yourself because no one has escaped. They're here with us. They didn't run out, they ran in. They ran into the innermost part of the place. They ran into where there was the the presence of God, where the glory of the Lord was being on display through giving praise through sacrifice, even though they were beaten and bloody. Now that's a powerful testimony. I don't know where God's going to send you. I don't know where God is going to, what he's going to ask of you. All I know is that whatever we go through, whether it's a valley of the shadow of death, we're not going to be alone. And I know that we're going to come out the other end of it, regardless. And I know that we have eternal life waiting for us and that there's pleasures forevermore and that in his presence for all eternity is the fullness of joy. And I can't wait for that. Amen? So think about it. You have to act upon faith. Amen? You think about the the Levitical priests that were going into the promised land. They were carrying the Ark of the Covenant on their shoulders. And they had to cross the Jordan River, but they didn't build a bridge. You know, they didn't build a dam and block it up. 
They were walking with the Ark of the Covenant. God said, go. Go across the Jordan. They didn't stop and say, well, <laughs> yeah, but how are we going to get across? We need a barge. We need a boat to get across. We need a, a bridge. We need to build a bridge. We need a, they didn't need a bridge. He just said, go. And by faith, they, they went. But you know what? The water did not part until the, until the sole of the first priest, the sole of his sandal was coming down. That's when it parted. And if they had stopped to wait to see if it was going to part, it would have never parted. Amen? Because you have to act to see the fact. Amen? You have to act. So, audacity is a willingness to take bold risks. It's daring, it's fearless, it's courageous. And faith is the audacity that rejoices in knowing that God cannot break his word. Now, God doesn't promise it. Look, a lot of places that people turn to talking about how God has delivered them and how God will be there and God will answer your prayers. If you just notice the context in a lot of those places, the, the, the uh, apostles or even Jesus, they are acknowledging that there's trials, that there are troubles. So we overcome, our faith overcomes, our faith is the victory in spite of whatever troubles we go through. Having said that, God wants us to come before him boldly. God wants us to step out in faith. God wants us to command diseases to be healed. Amen? He wants us to command demons to leave. He has given us authority over every foul spirit, and they tremble in our presence. And I know it, I've seen it. You know me. I don't fear those demons. They fear me, and I know it, and I've seen it. You know, but you know, there's things we fear. We fear failure. We fear we. You know, we maybe God doesn't answer our prayer like we think He's going to answer our prayer. So our faith is shook, but our faith is not really shaken as much as we think it is, because you haven't left God, have you? You haven't said, "Well, so long, Lord." I mean, I can't trust you anymore. I'm not going to serve you anymore. I'm not going to put. I'm not going to put my trust in you for my salvation anymore through Christ Jesus. If you're putting your trust in salvation through Christ Jesus, if you're putting your trust in the Lord for what he has provided in his own son, that's, that is faith. That is faith. And the truth of it is, prayers are not, and sometimes probably most of the time, they are not answered the way we expect them to be answered. Like Jody was praying, you know, Lord, I'm having trouble managing my money, so give me more of it. <laughs> yeah, that don't work. <laughs> that doesn't work, you know. That's just like saying, you know, my bag's got a hole in it, and I'm losing money, so give me some more money to put in my bag. You fix the hole. That's what you do. You just fix the hole. Whatever is draining you know, whatever's doing the draining, that's what you fix. Amen. So, and God wants us to be good stewards of whatever. In this case, our faith, because he has given us a measure of faith and he expects that faith to grow. Matter of fact, he says it should enlarge. We're to grow in faith. And understand this, not only are we given a measure of faith, but faith is a gift from God. You know, when we read about uh, Ephesians chapter 2, where we're saved by grace through faith, and it is a gift to, from God, and so that no one should boast. It's not from works, but it's, it's a gift from God. It's not talking that just that grace itself and our salvation uh, by grace is a gift from God, but that faith itself is a gift from God also, because we can't, we are saved by grace through faith. So it is a gift from God. So he's given each of us a measure of faith, and it is a gift. And just as he, he gives you a wife, he expects an increase. He gives you a husband, he expects an increase. He expects children, he expects you to go forth and multiply. Uh, as he gives you uh, finances or job, he expects an increase from that. He, you're to grow in the knowledge of the truth. You know, as you study the Bible, you're to learn more. You're to grow in faith. You're to grow in your love toward the Lord. Amen. And we are to grow in his power also. Faith looks 
Not faith, but fear looks and faith jumps. Amen? Faith sees it as an opportunity. I think about David. Everybody else feared Goliath. Goliath would step out on the plains there, you know, and there's all the Philistines there and all the Israelites are there. But one big guy steps out on the plain and they mocks Israel. He mocks the God of Israel and the army of the Lord and all the Israelites just cower. And they're afraid. I mean, for 40 days, every morning, they get all worked up, you know. You get them all worked up. We're ready to go to battle. And then Goliath steps out. Goliath steps out. And you know, you have to do some research, but one of the deeper meanings of the name Goliath is raging spirits. Raging spirits. And that's what was really speaking to the Israelites, was raging spirits through this big guy. And it caused their hearts to melt. And they had fear because of it. And what did they do? Well, they did what everybody that has fear does. They just look. <laughs> they just look. <laughs> like a deer, you know, who's caught in the headlights. They just stand there and look, you know. But faith doesn't stand and look. Unless you're looking at the salvation of the Lord. Look with expectation but not look with bewilderment. So fear just stands and looks and hesitates. Faith jumps. David ran to meet Goliath. He was offended. He just came to bring some provisions to his brothers. He was a shepherd boy. And he came to bring some provisions for his brother, you know, and he heard Goliath mocking the, the God, the army of God out there. And he said, who is this? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine who mocks the army of the Lord? Well, he just ran. You know, he ran to meet him with a slingshot and a rock. It didn't matter. He, could, he didn't need that. Because he had something. He had the true rock with him. The rock of Israel. He had the cornerstone that that, Egypt, that that Philistine was about to stumble over. His name was Jesus, or at, at that time, the God of Israel. So we understand now that faith never fails. Remember what we read in, well, let's turn there, 1 John chapter 5. Faith is our victory. It is our victory. 1 John chapter 5. You know, recently, brethren, uh, my little dog, Abby, uh, was really just listless. I could tell she felt bad, and she's such an active little dog. She loves to play fetch, she's very active, and she's a very happy little dog. And so it was just very difficult to see her where you know that she felt bad, she, she wouldn't eat, she wouldn't even drink water, and she'd just lay on the floor, or lay on the pillow, and she'd just kind of look at you. And it was difficult, it's really hard, you know, I mean, she's just like a child to us, you know, and, and um, she's young, she's five years old, about to turn six, so, you know, it wasn't old age or arthritis or anything. We took her to the vet, the vet thought that it was, uh, you know, just something in her back. And so she adjusted her, and she immediately seemed like she felt better. But it was hard to tell because when she was, when she was at the vet, I mean, she was, uh, you know, was it like an all-points bulletin, you know? <laughs> well, what's going on here? So she was alert. She didn't act like she acted at home. And uh, she didn't really want to be there, and she was watching everything. And so... You know, that's, but she really still didn't feel well. We had to take her twice. It turns out that uh, apparently she had a virus because, you know, they gave her antibiotics and just in about a couple of days she began to feel better and three or four days she was normal again. But, you know, Trent and I had trouble sleeping. She sleeps at the foot of our bed or I say at the foot of her bed. She moves around. We have a big bed, so she's not really in the way. But, of course, she wasn't moving around too much when she was sick. But, you know, we really felt uh, compassion for her. 
we felt so, you know, worried for her. We were concerned for her. And we felt like there wasn't much we could do. And so we would just let the Lord know that we're concerned. I know she's a, a dog, but we also know that you care about animals. You know, when every sparrow falls, you number the hairs on our head. You, you, you even care about the lilies of the field. So why should we think that you're not interested in, in a little animal that we love? You know, we love our pups, don't we? And I felt compassion for that little dog. And I felt compassion for some of our other little dogs when, when Stacia's pup, Lexi, had Parvo, you know. Uh, she was going to come to services, and I said, don't leave the pup. Stay there. You know, you can watch us online, but stay with that little pup. And Dr. Hurd, she did, and she, she, she recovered. But, you know, it's hard. But when we go through things like that, the Lord uses that to teach us compassion. Because, you know, you think about what Jesus once, you know, he saw the woman that was bent over and the devil had her bent over for 17 years and he felt compassion for her. He looked out over the multitudes and his heart turned, his in, insides turned over, he felt compassion. And listen, you're never going to pray fervently. You know what Leonard Ravenhill said, and I agree with him, the Lord doesn't hear prayer. He hears desperate prayers. He hears real prayers. He, re he hears a prayer that is where someone is, is truly seeking him, who, you know, uh, who acknowledges that they need him and, and that they're helpless without him in, in whatever situation it happens to be. I've done all I can do. I can't do any more. Lord, I need you. I need you. Can this cut past me? You see, so all of those things that we go through, we, we may not understand at the time, but there may be a situation years down the road where someone very dear to us is in a situation or maybe they're in a life-threatening situation. And we've discovered that we have a, a, a passion that pushes through the veil. That we have a, a passion for that, that we would not have had had we not experienced some of the trials and tribulations that we've had. They're hard, but they're not in vain. They're, amen? And it's not necessarily that God causes them but certainly God uses them. This is Satan's world. We're living in the devil's world. And so there's going to be situations, amen? But we have faith regardless. Listen, sometimes the devil has to plant a seed in order to grow something later. You see what I'm saying? In order to bring about something later, for an increase, for the glory of God, for a miracle, something else has to be let go of. Jesus himself had to do that. Speaking of himself, he said, unless this kernel of wheat fall to the ground and die, it can produce nothing. Nothing will come later. There will not be a harvest later. Sometimes we think that we lose things, but we don't. I really am convinced of that. I don't think that there's anything that we're going to lose because of the curse, as long as we're faithful, that in the kingdom to come, it will not be restored. I believe that. Matter of fact, it's called the time of the great restoration. What is a restoration? except restoring what was lost. And so we think of that oftentimes as just a principle. 
well, it's gonna, the earth is going to be... Now, what was lost? What have you lost? What have you lost? I mean, think about what Jesus said. There's no one who has lost mother, sister, brother, farm, family, job, no matter what, that you will not be given back a hundredfold. And I believe that accounts for anything and everything. Amen. So the willingness to take bold risks, to be daring, to be fearless and courageous with our faith. And faith is the audacity that rejoices in knowing God cannot break his own word. Faith looks, fear looks, faith jumps. Faith never fails and faith is our victory. 1 John chapter 5, verse 1. Whoever believes that Jesus is a Christ is born of God. And whoever loves the Father loves the child born of him. So understand, the emphasis here that I'm getting to in these scriptures, and they mean more than one thing. The context that we're reading this scriptures in is not in keeping the commandments. Uh, the context that I am not in love. The context that today that we're reading these scriptures in is the context of faith, of believing. Okay, so emphasize believing in this. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ, is born of God, and whoever loves the Father loves the child born of him. By this we know that we have lo- that we love the children of God when we love God and observe his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the, fi- the victory that has overcome the world, our faith, or simply believing. Our belief, believing. Who is the one who overcomes the world but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? So that's faith in Christ. And listen, faith in Christ is not just faith in Christ for salvation. Faith in Christ is faith in Christ, though he slay me, I will trust him. Faith in Christ is is though I'm sent to Macedonia, to the city of Philippi, to preach the gospel, well, maybe I'll go to prison first, maybe I'll be beaten with rods first, but I'm going to start a church here because God sent me here to do it. And therefore, I believe. I don't have any illusions to think that I'm not going to encounter opposition and things. I may have trouble. I may have trouble. But in the end, I trust in God, and God's going to bring me through it. Maybe I'll go through the valley of the shadow of death, but I will get on the other side. And while I'm in it, He will comfort me with his rod and with his staff. I believe. And believing in Jesus is not just believing in Jesus for our salvation. Believing in Jesus is believing in Jesus when we're going through troubles. And that and that and that those troubles are not in vain and he'll bring about good out of it. Believing in Jesus is believing that you can pray the prayer for the sick and the sick shall be made well. That you pray for a provision and God will provide that provision. It's praying that, look, I want this person raised from the dead, and they raise, they raise him. Look at the apostles. After, I mean, all ye of little faith became those of big faith, great faith, because they raised the dead. They healed the sick. They gave sight to the blind. Amen. They performed miracles. They cast out demons in the name of Jesus. So faith is our victory. Now notice verse 10. The one who believes in the Son of God has a testimony in himself. The one who does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has given concerning his Son. Now, what is the testimony that God has given concerning his Son? That he would be the ransom for us, that he would take away our sins, that in this covenant that he ratifies, that our sins would be remembered no more and that he would remove our sins as far as east is from the west, even from his memory. But it is also by his stripes you are healed. It's also, why do you worry? Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, why do you worry about what you don't have? Why are you worry? you know, why are you worried about these? Look at the, consider the lilies of the field. They're not worried about it. God provides for them. God will provide for you. Just have faith. That's what Jesus was saying in Matthew chapter 6. And the testimony is this, that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. That's our 
faith, victory. Who has the Son? He who has the Son has the life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. These things I've written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. This is the confidence which we have before him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request which he has asked, that we have asked from him. Now listen. The key, brethren, in having confidence before God. You know, James said, don't think you're going to receive anything if you waver. If you come before God and you're wavering, and uh, you know, there's several things that can cause you to waver. <laughs> several things do cause us all to waver, amen? But the key to being confident before the Lord is simply to draw near to the Lord. It is to make a conscious effort all the time to be thinking of the Lord, to draw near to Him, to be thinking about how we can please Him and obey Him, bring glory to Him. Father, what is Your will? Show me Your will. Your will be done. And when we draw near to God, and we're very, very close to God. And I know life, you know, our spiritual life is kind of like this, hills and valleys, but we're continuing going up. We've all been on peaks where it seems like God, we're just communicating back and forth with the Lord. We've all been in valleys where we say, where are you, Lord, you see? But when we draw near to the Lord and we have confidence we have confidence when we draw near Him, when we're seeking Him. And, you know, when we compromise, when we uh, uh, do the less than what we should, when we don't redeem our time maybe, and <clears throat> that's when the devil has an opportunity to come and then to say, well, God's not going to answer you or God's not answering you and the reason He's delaying answering you is because of you. He'll point at you. And uh, most of the time it's not. Most of the time the problem is not you. Now, that's not to say that we shouldn't examine ourselves. Not to say that at all. But most of the time that's not what it is. The Father loves you. He's already, if you're in Christ, He's He's already not imputed sin to you. And unless you are just practicing sin, you know, then that God has to get your attention for something, then it's usually, he's not going to do it that way by just not listening to you. He's, he's not doing that at all. So most of the time, it's just something that we have to press through. Amen? We have to press through. I mean, it was a long time. Job had to endure a long time, you know, before God restored him and healed him. That poor woman, 17 years, been over before, you know, God, through Jesus, healed her. These things happen. I mean, I've had times, I, I had a, a rotator cuff injury, and I couldn't raise this arm. It just, oh, it felt like someone just hit me stabbing you with a knife. And, uh, you know, this went on for a long time, well over a year, and uh, it was just terrible, you know. Just slipped and they just fall, it just hurt so bad. And one morning, you know, I prayed about it. I would pray about it, and I was anointed for it, but I still had it. This went on for over a year. One morning I got up and I went into the bathroom, brushed my teeth and uh, combed my hair and I did like this and I just stopped, looked in the mirror and I looked at my shoulder and I just did like this. My shoulder was completely healed. But I endured it for a time. I didn't lose my faith though. Now sometimes we think we lose our faith. We think, well, like... Uh, I just don't have faith. I don't really believe God's going to do it. It's not that we don't believe that God is not able. 
I know Donald Cowan said last time when I was visiting him, he says, not that I believe that God is not able to heal me of this cancer. I know he's able. I just don't know if, if he will or wants to, you see. So that's really not a lack of faith. That's just wondering what the will of God is. A lack of faith was saying, I don't think God even wants to, or that God can't, you know. Verse 11, and the testimony is this, that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has the life, and he who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. These things I've written to you, who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. Notice, this is the confidence which we have before him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us, and if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests which we have asked from him. So he may not give us what we ask for, but he will always give us something better, though, if, if it's not what we ask for. Amen. Now let's go over to Hebrews chapter 1 real quick, or chapter 11, verse 1. <clears throat> You know, Jesus said all things are possible with God. So we read the definition, the Bible definition of what faith is. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not yet seen. So it's being assured of things that we are hoping for. And it's being convicted that we will receive regardless of what we see. We may not see it, but it is more real than anything that we do see. So it is the assurance of things hoped for, and it is conviction. That means you have decided, you have a conviction, a judgment has been made, that you're believing in what you do not see. And, and for by it the men of old gained approval. By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. By faith Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain. Now think about that, Abel. Abel is counted among the righteous. Uh, I mean, we see Abel right here mentioned. And uh, the great cloud of witnesses we find in Matthew chapter 23, uh, Jesus called Abel righteous, that he was righteous. Now, Abel was righteous before the Lord. Abel sought the Lord, sought the Lord's will. He gave a better offering than his brother Cain did. And God did not accept Cain's offering. And we find in First. John chapter 3, the reason why is because Cain, Abel was righteous and Cain was not. So if, you, you know, if your heart is far from God, it doesn't matter what you try to give him. He wants your heart. He wants the gift from the heart. Amen? And so Cain's offering was rejected and Abel's offering was recepted was accepted by God. Now, but think about it. What happened to Abel? Here's a righteous man who gave a righteous sacrifice to God. And God received it. And as a result of that, Cain was so offended, his brother, so offended that he conspired to kill him. Now, God did do something. God went to Cain. And God said, now Cain, why are you so upset? If you don't do well, will you not be lifted up? All you have to do is do well. Turn your heart to me. And he said, sin is crouching at the door and you must master it. You have to overcome it. Sin is there. In other words, you've given by your bitterness and by your resentment, by your jealousy, you've given the devil an opportunity and sin is crouching at the door, but you can master it. You can master it. But you know he didn't master it. 
And even though God came later and said, where's your brother? God knew where he was. Because he told Cain, he said, I hear his blood crying out from the ground. You've murdered him. But notice that God did not stop Cain from killing Abel. He allowed Abel to die. And Abel was a type of Isaac. Abel was a type of Jesus. And Isaac was a type of Jesus. By faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous. God testifying about his gifts and through faith, though he, was, he is dead, he still speaks. So here's a righteous person who did everything right, who God loved, and who was attacked and killed by his own brother, who we find in 1 John chapter 3, was of the evil one. He became of the evil one when he decided to reject God's counsel and kill his own brother. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he would not see death. And he was not found because God took him up, for he obtained the witness that before his being taken up, he was pleasing to God. And isn't that what we want? To have that testimony that we're pleasing to God. I hope, you know, you're not thinking, well, I just want to be saved. I just want to you know, not be cast as profane in the lake of fire. Think about your relationship with your parents or your wife or your husband or your sister or brother. Would that, would you want a relationship with them that is like, well, I just want to get by. You know, I I really... I married this person uh, just, you know, because I just wanted to be married. And, uh, you know, uh, I, ne- I know it'll never be a great marriage, but I'll just, <laughs> it'll be good enough. You know, I mean, I'll just get by. I mean, nobody goes into that like that, that I know of. Do you? I mean, uh, you don't want to, somebody says, hey, uh, what do you think about your wife? You don't want them to say, well, she's kind of awesome. <laughs> Kinda, kinda awesome. My wife's kinda awesome, or uh, my husband is. You know, yeah, he, he, he's okay. Yeah, you know, he's he's okay. You don't want that. God doesn't want that kind of fellowship either with someone. He doesn't want someone to come to him and say, "Well, hey, Lord, you know, I mean, I just don't want to go to hell. So, what can we can we strike out some kind of deal here where you know we have." kind of a little bit of a relationship to where I don't go to hell, but, you know, I don't want to get too close, you know. So verse 5, By faith Enoch was taken up so that he would not see death. And he was not found because God took him up, for he obtained the witness that before his being taken up, he was pleasing to God. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. Now think about that. Without faith, You cannot please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. So they're rewarding those who seek him. Amen? Let's go over to James chapter 1. Now we talked a little bit about enduring faith. and That's the faith that where we trust God regardless of what our circumstances are like Job did. Like uh, Joseph did and many others. Even Abraham. I mean, you think about Abraham. I mean, Abraham offered Isaac. It seems kind of confusing. I'm going to give you a son. All the nations are going to be blessed. His descendants are going to be like the stars of the sky and the sands of the seashore. Uh, but before that, I want you to sacrifice him to me. So bring him up to this mountain and you sacrifice him to me. Being a husband and a father, I know that I'd be thinking about what am I going to tell my wife when I get back home? You know, I mean, Abraham's thinking, well, I know God's able to raise him even from the dead, but how am I going to explain to my wife that God told me to kill my son? That'd be rough. Here in James chapter 1, we'll begin in verse 2. 
Consider it all joy, brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. So we find that various trials do what? They test our faith. And if we endure or we overcome, then we, it produces endurance, an enduring faith. Amen? And let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If you just think about it, what if every time you, you, you ask anything, you ask the Lord of anything, and suddenly it just, I mean, suddenly appears. He answers exactly the way you expect him to, just like, there would be no endurance at all. There would no be, there'd be no patient endurance. There would be no enduring faith at all. Your faith basically would be getting what you want. Your faith would not be in, I have faith in you, though you slay me, I'm going to have faith in you. Though you send me to Macedonia and I get beaten with rods and in prison, I still trust you and I know that in the end, whatever I go through, it's necessary and it will bring about the greater good. Paul said that. I know you think that me being in prison in Rome is a bad thing, but it's turned out to be a good thing. I've preached the gospel here, and they're all believing me. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So we find here we can't be perfect and complete without endurance. Amen? And we can't have endurance without going through various trials. So we have to have faith in those trials. So it can't seem strange to us if God doesn't immediately answer and give us exactly what we need right at that moment, what we think we need. But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives all to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But he must ask in faith without any doubting. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. In verse 12, blessed is a man who perseveres under trial. Now, put those two together, understand. He's saying, now, a person that doubts, he shouldn't think that he should, you know, receive anything. But then he said, this is a context of various trials, right? And now he says, blessed is a man who perseveres under trial. For once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. So we can't think it as a foreign thing when we endure something for a season. Amen? Now, chapter 2, notice verse 14. What use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but he has no works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warm, be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. But someone may say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works, and I will show you my faith by my works. Now I ask you, what is a greater faith if you're experiencing something like Job? And in that, he still puts his trust in God, even though he says, even if he slays me, I'm going to put my trust in him. Or in Joseph, well, the Lord knows that I did not sin against my master, but I am unjustly imprisoned, and he knows it. And I'm here 10 years, but I'm keeping my faith in the Lord. He didn't lose his faith. A lot of people lose their faith, you know, if they don't get what they want or they think that God doesn't answer them the way they want. Now, that is, that is a powerful, enduring faith. And that can bring glory to God. Amen. Or Abraham, you know, being willing to offer his own son. That's a great, great faith. Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. So part of 
the works of faith is asking in confidence with great expectation. Father, provide for me. Father, heal this person in the name of Jesus by his traps. Asking in confidence and expecting. But a greater faith is, I don't know what's going on. I don't know why I'm going through what I'm going through. I don't know how I'm going to get through it. And I, and Lord, you seem so far away, but I'm still going to put my trust in you. Now that's an enduring faith. That's a faith that I don't know what you're doing, Lord. I don't even know what your will is in this. But I know you're my father and I know you love me. And I know as long as I love you, that something good is going to come out of it. I know that. And my experience is everything that I've been through in my 65 years, I wouldn't trade it. It's been invaluable to me. Even so, verse 17, faith, in his, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. So what are some of the works of faith? Well, asking with boldness, with great expectation, and seeing a miracle. Another work is trusting God when you don't know what's going on, and it sounds like he's not listening. He's not anywhere to be found. But you believe and trust in him anyway. Job didn't know why, what was happening to him. He was looking at himself. I can't see that in anything to bring this on. Why are all my children dead? I mean, think about what he, that poor man went through. And God loved him with an everlasting love. And we don't understand, you know, what all that, you know, why, but we will one day. And so will Job. But even at the end, he said, now I know you. I know you. But someone may well say, well, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one? Well, you do well. The demons also believe and shudder. But are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac, his son, on the altar? You see, that faith was working with his works. And as a result of the works, faith was perfected. I mean, afterwards, God said to Abraham, now I know you. I know you now. I know you in a way I didn't know you before. That you were willing to not withhold your own son from me. You see, God knows us. You hear me? I said, God knows us. Do you think he doesn't examine us? Do you think he's not looking? Does he, do you think God is not saying, I know what you will withhold from me? Well, I know you're willing to go so far, but are you willing to go all the way? I know you're willing to follow me through the green pastures, but will you follow me through the dry places? Well, I know you'll follow me in the, in the land of promise, but will you follow me through the wilderness, the desert the sin, uh, of Sinai? You know, that's what the Lord wants to know. He, you know, we are becoming what he is. He created us to be born into his family. You see, that faith was working with his works, verse 22. And as a result of the works, faith was perfected. It was perfected. Now, do you think Abraham, we don't know, but I think Abraham was probably expecting God to do something. I think, uh, you know, Abraham was probably expecting God to say, ha, oh, yeah, I said that, but this is what I'm really going to do. And ultimately, that's what he did. He, he provided a sacrifice. And Moses and, and Abraham knew he would. Well, because when Isaac said, well, Father, we have the wood, we have the fire, but where's the sacrifice? He didn't say you, son. He said, God will provide. God will provide. 
And if you think about that, that was a prophetic utterance looking forward to Jesus, that God would provide for us, and that that was a type. And Abraham was sharing a little bit in the sufferings of Christ. He was sharing in the fact that the father had to be willing to give up his own son. Abraham was given the honor of, you know, being asked to give up his own son, his only begotten son. And sometimes we're given the honor to give up something. And it's hard to give up something. It's hard to. It's hard to with joy for sure. But we really don't lose it. The father gave up his son, but you know many sons were raised. When Jesus came out of that, we were raised with him. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, And Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. In the same way was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? For just as a body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. Now let's go over to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Second chap- Second Thessalonians chapter 1. So we are given a measure of faith, and it is a gift from God, as we see in Ephesians chapter 2. Both grace and faith are gifts from God. So God expects an increase from anything He gives us. Just think about the parable of the steward. You know, He, he expects an increase. So we have to feed faith. Amen. Here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, notice verse 2. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Who ought always, we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brethren as is only fitting because your faith is greatly enlarged. So it's growing. Faith can be enlarged. Now, you know, it didn't shake Abraham's faith when God told him to offer his own son uh, Isaac. It didn't shake Joseph's faith, not to the point where he lost his faith, quit putting his trust in God, when Joseph was arrested and in prison for 10 years. You see. And it didn't shake Elijah's faith to the point to where he gave up on God when, you know, Ahab and Jezebel decided they were going to kill him, you know, marked him out to be killed and all that. And he just went to a cave and now he's fearful after the great victory at Mount Carmel. So sometimes we have great victories like that. And then the devil comes back. You know, and it's hard. But we have to just press through it, endure. And sometimes the devil will tell us, you don't really have faith. I don't know anybody here, and I know you guys pretty well. I don't know anybody here that doesn't have faith. But I know everybody here, the devil wants to tell you, wants you to believe that you don't have faith. But there's nobody that I know that's here that has not gone through a trial and kept their faith in God. That has gone through something and said, I don't know why, I don't know how, I don't know why the Lord let me go through this, I don't know why this happened, but I'm still going to put my trust in Him. That's faith. That's enduring faith. That's a much greater faith than praying and expecting to get something right now, even though we should do that too. But you understand both of those things are faith. I mean, the apostles prayed for people to be healed, but they also went through tribulations and trials. Look at Paul in prison. He was praying to be out of prison. God didn't bring him out of prison. He had faith in God while he was in prison. So whatever 
period, you find, circumstance you find you in, have faith in that circumstance. God is there. God hasn't forsaken you. And understand that we do need endurance too. We can't be perfected without it. Amen. So here verse 2, grace to you and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brethren. It is only fitting because your faith is greatly enlarged and the love of each one of you toward one another grows ever greater. Therefore, we ourselves speak proudly of you among the churches of God for your perseverance and faith in the midst of your persecutions. They have faith in the midst of their persecutions and afflictions which you endure. Now you know they're praying for God to give them relief. But somehow, sometimes how, the way God gives relief, relief is not to remove the problem, but to give you peace so that you're not troubled by trouble in order to bring about a greater good. This is a plain indication of God's righteous judgment so that you will be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which indeed you are suffering. So that's why they were suffering. You find in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, it says we must grow in our faith. Amen. So let's go over to Romans chapter 1. Not Romans chapter 1, Romans chapter 12, sorry. We read in James where faith without works is dead. We also see that when they asked Jesus, what is the work of God? They, the Pharisees, Sadducees said, tell us the work of God that we may do it. What is God's work? And Jesus said, God's work is believing in him whom he has sent. That's a statement of faith. Believe in God. Believe in Jesus. Now, verse 1 of chapter 12 of Romans. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Now understand, how are you going to know the will of God? Sometimes you will only know the will of God by the renewing of your mind. Amen? By having God renew your mind to get it out of the flesh, and into the Spirit. Because not everything is black and white in the Scriptures. It's talking about the will of God. For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment, as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. For just as we have many members in one body, and all the members do not have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. So again, we find that we, we need to have our minds transformed by the renewing of our mind uh, so that we will know what the perfect will of God is and that our faith would be enlarged. And our final scripture, we'll go over to Hebrews chapter 10. Because the key to it all is to draw near to God. To have perfect fellowship as much as we can with the Lord. So our final scripture is Hebrews chapter 10, beginning in 19, verse 19. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having a heart sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Now, the context of the book of, Rome, of uh, Hebrews is that these were Jewish believers who were wavering in their faith. Uh, they were being persecuted at this time. Some of them had their property seized. Now, they weren't 
you know, being uh, beaten and, and uh, martyred at this time, said they were not shedding blood, or having their blood shed, but they were being persecuted. So they needed to draw near to God with the full assurance of faith. Now, the, the reason I bring that up is they're going through difficult times. It's very difficult. But he says, come boldly with confidence to the throne of God. Draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance. You see, part of the devil will use these situations. He'll try to tempt us while the, where God is only testing us to try to cause us to waver or to lose our confidence, lose our assurance that God is in control. Let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, regardless of our circumstances. That's what they're saying. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling as together, as is the habit of some, but, to, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Hallelujah. Thank you.